Life Her Podcast. Hey ladies, podcast. Life Her Podcast want women to be themselves. It's nothing like taking that mask off and be you. We created this platform for women just like you. We don't judge other women, we uplift them. So listen to the stories of these amazing women that we are featuring this season. You are going to enjoy every moment of it. You may cry, you may laugh, but you will relate some form of fashion to motivate you. Hey ladies, this is Life Her Podcast where we listen to women's testimonies and their different stories of things that they've been through in life, overcame, and they are still striding every day. I would like to welcome Tamara Cummings. Hi, Tamara. Hey. How are you today? Good. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. Um, We have different things that go on in women's personal lives. What do you think about today's women? Um, I think that they are finding themselves. They are using that power to empower other women. And they're really a, a force for change out here right now. I think women are really finding themselves and using their voice to uh, I, help other people. I have to agree with you because I was looking at an article of seeing a lot of women that are judges now. They're running for council. They're running. They even want to be the president now. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's really uplifting and inspiring. And I think a lot of people don't realize how powerful women are either. Mm-hmm. And a lot of men that are here today, they don't recognize that you come from a woman. Right. <laughs> we are the one that produced you. Right. So you are the way you are because of me. So I really love the wave that's going on right now. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, I am 42. I have four kids. Um, They go from 25 to 17. I have a three-year-old grandson. Mm -hmm. And I work as what's called a peer supporter with Catholic Charities. So I help people coming out of addiction rebuild their lives. Oh, wow. What got you into that? (coughs) Excuse me. I myself am a recovering alcoholic. I have almost seven years clean. And so once I got out of addiction, I realized I needed to go back in and help other people find their way out. Oh, wow. That's a blessing from when you, you know, just take your heart out and just to help others overcome. Mm -hmm. I think what I like the most about people that's in your field is nothing like someone that had experience helping another person Mm -hmm. overcome something. Because sometimes we see things of people that never been through anything and they really get frustrated with people that are going through it and not really understanding where they come from so it's a true blessing that it's something that you have been through but you have took time out to actually help others do you really love doing that i love my job i I love it. it it gets exhausting at times you know and you get you get you have your moments of frustration um but for the most part you know to be able to step into somebody's life and be that beacon of hope and offer it to them and say, you know, I, I can help you out of here. And, you know, they, they willingly go with you and they're, you know, they're ready for that change and you're able to watch them grow and watch them reach their goals and get to that next level. Mm -hmm. It's, it's the most rewarding thing. It's, I've never had a job that makes me cry like this. You know, I cry on a regular basis. I'm just like, I'm so proud of them. Aww. It's uh, it's good. So as you watching people recover, does it give you like things that play back on your personal life? And you'd be like, God, was I like this or did I do this? And you know, know exactly what I was like. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I, I, I don't think it, it doesn't, um, as far as like what I went through, it doesn't really play into that. It does help me grow. It does give me a lot of God moments where I'm yeah. able to s- visibly see him working right. in someone's life. Um, so it doesn't really, you know, I don't have flashbacks or anything like that. Of, oh, I did that or I did that. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, tell my story candidly with my with mm-hmm. my clients. Right. And I'll let them know. But I don't recall there ever being a moment where I was like, oh, God, that happened to me too. Oh, my gosh. You know? Okay. So, yeah. Okay, that's good. Um, so tell us a little about you as far as your childhood. How, what was it like? Well, I was adopted at the age of three. I was um, born into a relatively racist family, and they didn't realize I was mixed when I was born, or until I was born, and you know my color, mm-hmm. a little bit of it came in. Okay. Um, and so it. From my understanding, it turned out to be fairly abusive. My grandfather was not 
pleased that there was a black person in the family now. So at three, I was given up for adoption, um, adopted into a family in Firestone Park. There was five of us. I was the second oldest. Two of them were theirs biologically, and then three of us were adopted. Okay. So I would say it was a normal childhood. You know, we went on vacations, went camping, rode our bikes, you know, everything like that. Um, but it was something always in me that I, I never belonged. I never knew where I fit in, even in that family. It was like, I'm just kind of here, just transplanted, and mm-hmm. there's people around me, but I'm alone. What made you feel that void? I think it was just not being grounded in who I was and where I belonged. You know, when you're given up for adoption, you kind of, you're being ripped away from your roots. Right. You know, imagine you have a big, strong tree and you take a branch off and you just kind of throw it in the yard. That branch is just there. Did you go from, you know, of course, your family that gave you up for adoption, where they were Europeans? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, so the family that you end up going to, were they Europeans also? Yes. Yes. So was that what made you feel awkward it also? It wasn't, no. It was, color wasn't an issue. Race wasn't an issue. Um, it had not, you know, it wasn't that. Uh, that was more of an issue with my peers because back okay. then there wasn't a lot of mixed kids. Oh, know? okay. I was, it, it, that was a whole other journey in itself. Um, I think it was just something inside of me that just didn't feel like I belonged, you know, it wasn't anything that anybody did. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, when you suffer that much trauma at a young age, Mm -hmm. you don't know how to process it. And it just leads to abandonment issues. Wow. So what you going through that process of feeling that way, did it lead you into another direction in life? Did you find a void or what? I had a huge void because of it. I mean, I was looking for love, (laughs) Wherever I could get it, I was just looking to be accepted. Um, you know, I, I, I got to a point where I was too black for the white kids and I was too white for the black kids. You know, they would dub me, my nickname was Little White Girl. To this day, some people still call me Little White Girl because, oh, you talk so proper, look how you act. And I'm like, I don't know how to act any other way. Just being you. Yeah, and, so, and then the white kids, you know, I was too black for them. I was just this odd string bean with nappy hair and... You know, skinny, weird girl who just doesn't really fit in. So I never, I really like never fit in anywhere growing up. Wow. So how did, how was it during middle school? You know, middle school was kind of different from elementary and high school. Yeah, I was a mess. I mean, my grades were decent. Um, But the older I got and the more that I was looking for acceptance and love, of course, I naturally gravitated to men. Um, I was, I think it was 13. When I lost my virginity, I was being made fun of in school for being a virgin. So I was like, well, I'll teach you guys a lesson. I'm not going to be a virgin anymore. Went from being a virgin to a hoe the very next day. It was like, <clears throat> well, I just can't win with you people. Right. Um, and then it eventually ended up to me running away at 14 to be with a man who was 23. And uh, I didn't realize at the time, you know, I'm, I'm dating a child molester. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we got a whole another set of stories from there. So, when you dated this guy, I mean, where did you meet him at? Um, He used to hang out a couple houses up from us. He was like the Boy Scout uh, leader, the Boy Scout troop leader. Mm -hmm. And so, he used to hang out at one of his scouts' houses. And so, I met him. And uh, we told my parents he was 19. And my parents were like, yeah, no, he's not. Mm -hmm. They found out he was 23. And they're like, you can't see him anymore. And I was like, well, I'll show you. Yes, I will. And eventually it just led to me running away to be with him. So where did you guys run away to? Abandoned houses, cars, park benches. Um, we slept any and everywhere. Really? Well, you didn't miss home? You didn't, Or you just felt like you just wanted to be with him? Um, at that point, I had convinced myself that I was in an extremely abusive home. My parents were whooping my tail because I wasn't listening, but it wasn't abusive you know he had me convinced that he that I was actually older than 14 you know they don't really know your birth your real birth or your birthday so you're probably older it was just a whole you know when you have this lost little child and somebody is feeding manipulating you you. yeah you're like oh you're right you know you love me they don't so ran away to be with him and uh stayed with him for a couple of years Mm mm-hmm um you know, like I said, we were living here to there. My parents were looking for me. They'd find me every so often. And 
I'd go to Dan Street, go back home, run away again. This just went on two, three times until they were finally like, we're done. Like, we're not, you know, you clearly don't want to be here. And um, so him and I were, you know, we'd find an abandoned house or I'll never forget the time we were sleeping on a park bench. We got those silver blankets you can unwrap from mm-hmm. Walmart. And we slept on the park bench with it and I woke up and I <laughs> let out the biggest burp because I had been swallowing outside air right. all night. Um, we would sneak into, like, the Boy Scout camp and sleep in those cabins and tents when nobody was around. I mean, it was bananas. We were Why? homeless, homeless. Sleeping in people's cars because they didn't want us in their house. We'd go so sleep he didn't people. feel awkward for being 23, I homeless? Guess, I guess not. You know, he had a companion to, to deal with his BS. And, you know, I'm just like, yeah, great. This is love. We're right. Love. Wow. So what got you out of that situation? What made you just leave him alone? All and right, so... We <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> All right, so when I was sixteen, I got pregnant with my son. I cheated on him and got pregnant with my son. He knew there was a high probability it wasn't his baby, but you know he loved me so, so he was going to stay with me. My parents had found out through the grapevine that I was pregnant. I was about six months pregnant with my son at the time. He said, "Well, they were like, we know for a fact you're having sex with her now because they could never prove it. They always wanted to get him for statutory rape." Uh, we know for a fact that you're having sex with her, so we're going to give you 48 hours to marry her, or we're charging you with statutory rape. They went down to the courthouse, signed the papers, and I called their bluff, and I married him. So we got married in his grandfather's living room two days later. Um, it was March 17th of 1994. Um, we got married in his grandfather's living room, and we had a bucket of chicken and an acne cake in the kitchen. That was our reception, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I had on a blue dress. He had on a Carl Kanai pair of shorts and a Duke Blue Devils t-shirt, and you know, the aisle was in between the couches. I had invited like three or four friends and they're sitting on the couch and, you know, I come walking down the aisle and I'm laughing, I'm cracking up like, what is this? Like, is this really happening? And I'm laughing all the way up to the aisle and, uh, you know, the, the preacher's going through the vows and I'm still cracking up. And then he was like, do you take this man for the rest of your life? And I stopped laughing and I looked at him and I was thinking, I don't want to be with you for another minute. Like, wow. I don't like you. And then I look over at my guests, and I'm in my 16-year-old mind, I thought, if I say no, they're not going to get any chicken or cake, and they're going to be so mad that they came here and they don't get any chicken or cake. And um, so I looked at him, and I was like, I do. And I'm like, my stomach dropped. I was like, oh, my God, what am I doing? So we go into the, the reception in the kitchen, and I have this bucket of chicken. I'm like, here, you guys, here's some chicken. And they're like, no, 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 no. We're not hungry. I'm like, wow. We've been eating chicken all week. We've been eating baked chicken, boiled chicken, fried chicken. And all I could think was, I said yes, so you can have chicken. Some chicken. <laughs> not you going to eat this chicken. you go going to eat this chicken. And um, so be on the lookout for my book. It's going to be called Chicken Cake, and I do. Oh, wow. Um, it's in the process. I'm writing it now, just taking my time. So we got married. I had my son. Um, my son was about three months old, and I went and cheated on my husband again. Got oh. pregnant with my daughter. Wow. Two kids. So two kids that aren't even here. <laughs> yeah, so one day we're talking and we're working out our marriage. And I'm like six weeks pregnant. He didn't know I was pregnant at the time. We're laying down and we're talking. We're working, you know, t- attempting to work things out. I was like, well, I have something to tell you. He's like, what's up? I'm like, I'm pregnant again. Girl, he got up, walked out of the house, <laughs> and never came back. Like, I don't know where he went. <laughs> he went to somebody else's house. Like, he just bounced. Um. Wow. And that was the so, end of that. So he just knew it wasn't his? Yeah, he knew it wasn't his. We weren't sexually active. Oh, okay. Okay, so yeah. yeah. But he automatically like, forget this. So he knew the first kid wasn't his uh-huh. also. Uh-huh, but he was willing to accept that one. Oh, mm-hmm. wow. And so, yeah, that was uh, that. was that. He left me, and at that point, I was 18 with two kids. Wow. Yeah. And I had dropped out of high school in, like, I think I finished my ninth grade. Mm-hmm. And then that was that was it. I you know I did a couple of weeks of the tenth grade, and that was mm-hmm. about all you can handle when you're you know you're pregnant, hop and flop, flopping right? House to house. So um, did you you guys ever end up getting going through with a divorce and everything? So that's a whole other story in itself. So <laughs> <laughs> all right, so you know we still remain in contact throughout this, but at that point, my son at about one. My son was about one, and I realized I couldn't do it with two kids. So I asked him if my son could live with him, and I was taking care of my daughter. I was living with a friend at that point. 
So my son went to go live with him. He was living with friends and stuff. And um, about six months to a year later, we the divorce was finalized, and we ended up with shared parenting. He was the custodial parent or the main caregiver for my son, and I kept my daughter with me, and I was granted visitation. So about a year into this, you know, I'm picking up my son every weekend, and we're just following the standard visitation. Mm -hmm. I drop him off one weekend. My son was three at the time. Drop him off. By this point, we're divorced, you know, living our separate lives or whatever. Drop off my son. Go back the following weekend to pick him up, and they're not there. And I'm like, where is, you know, where are they, you know? Don't think nothing of it. Go back the following week. This goes on for about two to three months, and I'm like, where the hell is my child? And his mom, you know, calling him, I'm not getting through to him. And his mom finally looks, is like, you don't know? And I'm like, no. She's like, they moved to Georgia. Wow. I'm like, what do you mean they moved to Georgia? She was like, yeah, he went to court and got it approved. So I went down to the courthouse where he filed the motion to relocate, but it was never approved through a judge. He just up and left. Oh. So the address that he left, that was way back in the 90s before the internet was around. So I mm-hmm. had to get pretty creative to find him. So the address that he left, they were no longer at. I just didn't have a way to get to Georgia. So what I would do is you can call the library up here and do what's called a crisscross. Mm-hmm. They will locate the four closest neighbors to you and uh, you, you they'll give you their number. So I would run crisscrosses and, you know, give them the address and they'd give me the neighbors and I would call them or I would call the utility companies and say, you know, I think my ex-husband is using my daughter's social security number. Give them his and they would say, oh, yeah, he's at this address. I'd call the neighbors. The neighbors would be like, he's gone. He left like three months ago, but he did have a little boy with him. Wow. This went on for six years. Six years? Six years. I was always like three to six months behind them. I was every time I managed to find them, they were gone again. I mean, I had missing posters out of my son, um, everything. And then uh, one day, and the only way that God knows how to work in my life, I met a man named Jeremy. We had been friends, and we ended up dating, and I got pregnant with him, but with my youngest son. That's his dad. Okay. And we're just laying there talking one day, and I'm like, yeah, my ex-husband, blah, blah, blah. I know he's married. His his uh, wife's name is Lisa. And he's like, Lisa what? And I told him, he's like, that's my sister, because that's how God works. <laughs> and I'm like, are you kidding me? So now I connected with her family, and they didn't know. Everybody's saying they don't know where they're at. They know they're in Georgia. They just don't know where they're at. So I just kept harassing them and harassing them. And finally, one day, somebody blurted out, I don't know what room they're in. Now, this is five and a half years in. So you just told me they're in a hotel, you know, logical. So Jeremy is, do he know that he's a father of him? This Jeremy, you saying Jeremy was Jeremy's a father? Jeremy's my of son's father. Okay. My youngest son's father. Okay. He's 17. Okay. My oldest son is 25. Okay, gotcha. So, yeah, so just weird family, you know, the way acting works. So somebody finally blurted out, we don't know what room they're in. So I... Reduced from that, they're in a hotel, and, you know, if you have a family, you're going to be in an extended stay hotel. So, one day, I just called every hotel in the area that I assumed they were in until I found what room they were in. I, th- I found him. And he was using a mailbox, uh, mailboxes, etc., across the street for his mail. So, I went to the courthouse. I mean, I literally cried from morning to night that day. It was a mess. I went to the courthouse, got the paperwork sent down there. Um to get him served. In the meantime, I called the room again and told my ex-husband, I know where you're at, bring me my son. He went and yanked my son out of school that day and went off running again. Wow. But by that point, he had already been served. So, he uh, had to come up here with my son to Man. attend the court hearing. And my son walked in the room. He was nine years old at this time. He had no idea I even existed. He walked up to me and I looked at him. I was like, do you know who I am? And he looked at me and was like, no. I was like, I'm your mom. And we just kind of stood there and stared at each other like, what is this? Wow. So I got him that year for Thanksgiving. They were trying to reintegrate him into my life. So he came up and he, you know, he just brought up to me a couple of weeks ago how he remembered when he came home to all the presents and he didn't realize that it was presents from every birthday and every Christmas that he was gone. So he was nine years old opening up blocks from when he was four. And um, so he came home, and he just stayed in his room. He was very distant, and, you know, everybody was coming over to see him, and he didn't know these people. He had two new siblings, you know, at this point. He had no idea who these kids were. He had no idea who I was. So he stayed very, very distant. And he told me right before he went back, you know, he finally opened up. He was like, can I tell you something? I was like, yeah. He's like, we're not living in the hotel anymore. We're living in a car now. 
and this was a court order visitation and I called the cops I said I can't send him back like I can't send my son back he has a room right there you know I can't send him back to live in a car right and the cop looked at me and said if you want to get your son back you have to send him back and it was I mean, how do you not see somebody for six years, find out they're living in a car, and send them back yeah. as a mother? And he don't even crushed, want to go back in a car. Crushed. So I sent him back, and I was supposed to have him for New Year's again. And New Year's comes, and there's no sign of my ex-husband. He's off and running again. And, uh, you know, I'm reaching out, I'm reaching out, and I'm like, here we go with this shit. And so <clears throat> I got a call New Year's Eve from his wife at the time, which was my other baby dad's yeah. sister. Um, she said, he was drunk. He's in jail. He was in an accident with your son. I have him, and I'm going to send him to you. So at the time, I was working as an exotic dancer. And, honey, I stripped my tail off to get the, the money for the plane ticket for my son to come up here, right? Mm -hmm. So he was supposed to come up here like two to three days later. Well, my ex-husband got wind of what was happening and told his sister to go pick up my son. And his sister took off with my son. Wow. My son did not get up here until January 9th of the following year. Um, we went to court. The court ordered me through all of this, ordered me full, full custody, him no visitation. They asked me if I wanted to file charges on him. I said, I just want my son back. Throughout all of this, I was picking up an addiction. I was dealing with alcohol and cocaine. I, I went to court to get custody of my son high on meth. I hadn't been asleep for like two days. Um, so because you're just going through the pain. Yeah. So, um, uh, you know, through all of this, like I said, I'm picking up the addiction. I'm still stripping. I've got you know these kids, and my son's home now. And he was he was mad. He was very resentful. He didn't know who you know. He still didn't know who we were. Right. You know what I'm saying he spent a week with us. He didn't know us. Um. My ex-husband kind of dipped off into oblivion, you know, didn't really hear from him much anymore. And I raised my son and, you know, it took a long time for us to rebuild a relationship. Like, yeah. I yeah, I didn't know him. He didn't know me. We were both very, very angry. Um, so he's home and life is going on. My addiction is kicking up. CSB is getting involved, taking the kids. I'm getting them back, taking the kids. I'm getting them back. And uh, so that's. It's like he couldn't win for losing either yeah. at that moment. Mm -hmm. So what got you into stripping? What made you start doing that? It was, you know, fast, easy money. I was 18 when I started. I was living in the Rosemary. got my first apartment in the Rosemary. And uh, I don't know what made me say one day, like, oh, this is it for me. But I went and I made a couple hundred dollars. And I was like, well, shoot, this is way better than any other job I'm going to get. Mm-hmm. I was so scared the very first day I was sitting, I, was, I used to be really, really shy. And I was sitting there like a church mouse. And this, I'll never forget this loud mouth dancer named Monette came up to me. She was like, oh, honey, after a couple of drinks, you ain't even going to think about it anymore. And sure enough, after a couple of drinks, voila. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. didn't even think about and, it no yeah, more. Didn't even think about it no more. And it just became what I did, you know, off and on. I'd quit while I was pregnant with another baby and go back into it. So I, uh... Like you said, I had four kids by the time I was 25, and I didn't stop stripping until I was, like, in my early 30s, I believe. Really? Mm, so, what was got... what was life like? Did you ever extend doing stripping and extend yourself from the men that come in and you go out with them and have sex with them? Yeah, yeah I... that's part of the territory. Really? You know, that's part of the territory. Um, I would stop intermittently and go to college or... This or that, I did manage to, through it all, get, like, this general education, or not general, I did get my GED when I was 18. Um, That's good. Then I went to college for general, not college, it was acrobat, adult vocational services, mm -hmm. you know, um, I got a general office clerical certificate, and then I, you know, went back to dancing, and then I ended up going to school for a little bit for private investigation, and then I went back to dancing, um, so I did stop intermittently and you okay. know, live a quote-unquote normal life. It mm -hmm. wasn't just like a long string right. of it. Um, so yeah, but I mean, I did everything that, that you know, the life came with. Right. Wow. It was, uh... What's the, um... Was besides you losing your son going through that process during your during the times when you were stripping, what is probably the most scariest thing you went through while you were stripping? I would say 
I mean, there's some things I can't talk about because That's fine. it would just put other people's freedom in jeopardy. Um, there was an instance when I first started dancing, when I still lived in the Rosemary, there were these guys, and we used to always have guys around us. We were always hanging out with different different men, and they asked me if I wanted to go hang out, and I was like, sure, and I ended up at the hotel up in Arlington, the Red Roof Inn, and the one guy, him and I had sex, and there, there was a there was a double bedded side, you know, double beds in the room mm-hmm. and um him and i had sex and all of a sudden his friend pops up from next to the bed and he's like i got your clothes if you don't have sex with me i'm gonna throw them on the roof and i'm like i need my clothes and i'm standing there in a towel thinking i just need to run out because i'm surrounded by men there was like three men in the room expecting me to have sex with them so one said if you have sex with me i'll give you your clothes back the other one said i'll get you home like it was just really um disgusting you know Mm -hmm. what they did and when I told them no somebody pulled out a video camera and they started ripping off the towel and it was it was pretty traumatic to to get out of that room and then a whole situation happened after that one of them was no longer alive but um you know that we um I, I went through a lot with you know dealing with men they've they're very men are disgusting Mm-hmm. Men are absolutely disgusting. And I was getting ready to ask you, what's your point they, of view on men? They, they, when you don't give them what they want, they take it. And they take advantage of you. Well, how, do, how does that carry on until now? Like, since you're recovered, you've been drug-free and everything. How does that go as far as now that you're older? Do you plan on dating or do you find yourself wanting to get remarried and find that ideal person? I, you know, it, it just, it comes and goes. Some days I do wonder if there's a match out there for me, you mm-hmm. know, and I, I, some days I long for that. Mm-hmm. And then other days I'm like, there's no way in hell I want anybody in my space. Um, some days I'm like, you know, I want to date somebody nice. And other days it's like, I'm going to date four or five people and get them for what I can and just bounce out. Right. You know, it, uh. I actually started trauma counseling because I'm like, this isn't, this, this is not a healthy way to do this. Mm-hmm. But it's almost like I'm gonna give you guys what you gave me, you know, a broken heart. Yeah. And you like guys... you become numb, mm-hmm. basically. It's, yeah, it's your turn to suffer now. So it's almost like I'm heartless a little bit, you know. Right. So how is your relationship now with your children? Good. That's good. good. Yeah. So my son is out in New Jersey with a, he has his own baby now. So okay. that's my grandson. So I'm out there like every six weeks to two months. Okay. We just helped them move last weekend. And so we, uh, you know, it's, it's an ongoing rebuilding because, you know, there was a lot of anger on his part, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, for me, I was, I was kind of, I guess, a, oblivious to the pain that I caused them because I was dealing with my own. I mean, I had brought a lot of abusive men into their lives you know they had to watch me get beat up they had me put in the hospital um so you know they lived through all of that trauma and I never really looked at what they went through it was always about what I went through so you Mm -hmm. know it's been we have a good relationship it's been a lot of repairing um you know I can't do anything to take it back the only thing I can do is you know be a better mom moving forward and try to be there for you and understand that what you went through sucked you Mm -hmm. know that's one thing I've learned is you can't I can't negate what you went through. That's not that's not fair for me to say, oh, you had a good life. Remember when we went to the county fair and we went... Yeah. That's not... I can't do that to them. So, you know, I listen and I, you know, it sucks and I go away and I cry. And, you know, oh. I try to process it. Like, what did I do to my kids? I'm thankful that they're still around, you know. Um, <clears throat> I was never abusive as a mother. I would call it more neglectful, mm-hmm. you know can't be very present when you're out for two or three days and you know then you sleep for two days and you know you've got toddlers running around and you know but you know you um even though you went through that process it's to a point where you were never recovered as a child Mm -hmm. so you were dealing with so much hurt and pain and you was just taking life day by day Mm -hmm. however okay today is a new day however this day go that's just how it's gonna go so it seemed like you just lived like that because you were so used to so much pain. Mm-hmm. And it was like you didn't know what direction to go into. You didn't have no form of mentors or nothing, did you? Yeah. And nobody really there for you. Yeah. yeah, so dealing with that, that's, that's hard. 
in so many ways. I, I commend you on your today's progress because it, it takes a lot. And then also the fact that you're getting help and you're seeking help still until this day. A lot of people won't even admit that. And a lot of people wouldn't even seek the help that they really need. Because it's going to take time. You know, it's, it's always going to take time. But the fact of you recognizing it, that's the huge step right mm-hmm. there. Because no one can really recognize their faults. It was it was hard to, you know, because I'm, I'm so giving, you know. I just naturally love people. I'm very empathetic. And I can almost, like, look at a picture and feel somebody's pain. And it just, like, cracks me. I'm like, oh, my God. So I'm always, you know, reaching out to just love other people. Uh, you know, but I find myself in certain circumstances where I'm just lashing out with hate. And I'm like, where is this coming from? What is this? You know, I don't like this part of me. I don't like, you know, so there was a lot to get me to the point where it's like, <clears throat> all right, I got to do something for me. I've got to, you know, help me mm-hmm. figure this out because it, it's going to be the same way. Ten years from now, I'm going to be the same person. And I, I like me, you know, I really do. But I'm not the best version of me. Right. And there's plenty of room to become that, too. But like I said, just you recognizing it, it takes a lot. I think it's more or less you like to see so many other people happy mm-hmm. and because you've been through so much. Mm-hmm. So it's like you just keep pouring into people. But you need people pouring into you also mm-hmm. with love and not arterial motive or anything like that. Mm-hmm. You just need the same love back. It's like you treat people the way you really want to be treated. Yeah. If people really notice that, they will understand you a lot better. Yeah, you're, that's exactly what it is. Because I was just thinking the other day, like, I wonder if anybody's ever going to do for me what I do for, for others. And I don't do it for something back. But, mm-hmm. you know, I don't do it for things in return because I just genuinely like mm-hmm. helping people get to where they want to go. But, you know, you look back and it's like. Yeah. And it's crazy because I be feeling the same way, too. And I be like, dang, I'm so good to people. Like, when somebody is... But it's like, I done got to a point where I become numb. And it's like, now I really don't expect people to treat me yeah. the way I treat them. Because that's just the form. Uh, that I guess that's how God created me well, to be here. you get resentful. And then yeah. you know you're holding resentment towards them. And, yeah. You know, you're laughing at them on social media like, ha, ah, you got your heart broke again. Yeah. You know, and I'm yeah. like, ew, no, I don't want to, you know, that's not. Yeah. You just want to be, you know, just content, happy, mm-hmm. steady, healthy, yep. mentally, yep. you know. Mm-hmm. So it was, it's, it's a lot. And so it, it's good that you just taking the process steps. To get better. Yeah. It's going to take time. It's going to take time. We got a whole <laughs> yes. Pandora's box to open up. Yes. We got segments of life that are like, okay, let's process this part. So. Yes. I'm ready for it, though. I'm at a place where, you know, I'm ready for it. I'm trying to make me a priority. And, and it's hard with the nature of my work and my life and stuff. And, you know, I said that a couple weeks ago. I said, I'm going to make me a priority. You know, because I'm with clients. Sometimes I'm with them from 7 a.m. to like 8 or 9 p.m. Mm-hmm. And there's really no time for me. I come home and the house is a mess and I've got to clean. And, you know, I'm too tired. I just want to rest. And the next day I look at my calendar and it's jam-packed again. I'm like, I can't keep. What is this? Like, what am I doing? Right. And, you know, I'm looking at the way my clothes fit. I'm like, I hate my body right now. I hate the way I feel. And so I'm like, I'm going to do something for me. You know, mm-hmm. and I started carving out time in my calendar for me. And wouldn't you know, people started, you know, I need you this day or I need yep. this day. And it, it gives me anxiety because I'm like, no, like I, I, I need something for me. Like y'all can't keep just taking me and I can't, there's nothing left for me. You know, I, mm-hmm. I'm not the best version of me and I'm giving you guys, I'm, I'm left with scraps. Right. I'm literally left with scraps of myself and that's not okay anymore. It's, it's not, mm-hmm. you know, and I'm tired of going against what I feel like I need to do to, to better myself. Right. You know, because everybody else needs. Well, your need will still be there. Sometimes I got to come first. Yes, you have to. I'm proud of you that you're doing that. That's something I'm still working on. <laughs> I had to put my foot down. I'm Seriously, mad. I'm still working on it, but I'm getting better by the day. Yeah. You know, just working on that progress. Um, what led you to um, run for council? <laughs> A friend of mine asked. <laughs> Tara Samples from Ward 5 she just asked me she said why don't you run for council and my first question to her was 
do you need an opponent so you have somebody to beat? <laughs> <laughs> Is that how this works? Yeah, there have to be two people there. She's so bomb. Too. One winner and one loser. <laughs> like, I didn't know. Yeah. And she said, no, I want you to run for uh, Ward 7. And I didn't even know what a ward was at the time. Like, I'd heard mm-hmm. of it, but I didn't know what it was. And I'm like, yeah, that's probably going to be a no for me. So when I looked on the map and saw what Ward 7 was, and I started going to the different neighborhoods, Wilbeth, Arlington, Holmes, mm-hmm. the south side. You know, I've lived in Firestone Park my whole life. I know what the deal is over there. Firestone Park is Firestone Park. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? You're going to get your first priority in Ward 7. Always has been, always will be. Um when I started talking to these residents and finding out what their needs were and looking at their living conditions and stuff, and I was like, nobody comes down here to help you guys? Like, you don't have anybody advocating for you? And they're like, no. And I'm like, this is not okay. This is seriously, this is not okay. And so I really did it for the underdog, you know, for the residents who are being Mm -hmm. left behind, who aren't getting access to resources that they need to advance their life, to, you know, to give these kids an opportunity um, so, you know, once I started talking to them, I was like, how can I not do this? Mm-hmm. Um, so that's what I did. And, you know, we were off and running. Mm-hmm. Definitely shocked the city. They were not expecting that. Nobody was expecting that. <laughs> My opponent wasn't expecting that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do you plan on trying it again? Uh, not word seven. I don't think I'll ever run in word seven. We had a very, very nasty race. Really? It was nasty. It was a trauma in itself. I mean, I was being attacked daily. He has this staunch group of followers. They are kind of like Trumpsters. Really? And they were just attacking me on every level. My kids were scared to go outside. It was insane. It was that bad? I was like, don't let them know that you're my child. You know, we were, it was, our house got egged. It was nuts. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, every day they were just attacking me. You know, I got a criminal record. I come with the past. I am very colorful, like some fruity pebbles. Right. Uh, you know, um, so they pulled up everything. You know, she has a, she got his unpaid parking ticket. She was charged with domestic violence when I cussed at my son when I, you know, got drunk. Mm-hmm. What was catalyst to all this. I mean, they were pulling it all up. And I'm like. I mean, that's what comes with it. But at the I'm same like, time, I'm like, like okay, you're sitting up here egg in my house. Just imagine mm-hmm. things that you've done. Yeah. I, Secretly, I mean, we had but us not even knowing. We had the pe- the uh, Cleveland reporters coming down to interview me. It was a mess. I mean, I was almost kicked off the ballot. Like, they were trying to do whatever they could to get me out of this race. They wanted me what? out. Um, so, you know, I just kept going, though. I would, you know, put on a brave front in the daytime and at night I would sit home and cry. I'd be like, why am I doing this? And I would just think about the people who, you know, I had met throughout the week who were like, thank you. Thank you for stepping up to be a voice for us. And so I just kept going for them. It became, it wasn't about me anymore Mm -hmm. at all. You know, honestly, I didn't even care if I won or not. I'm like, I'm living my life. You know, my bills are paid. I got my job. I got my career. I'm good. You know, I'm doing this for y'all. And, um, so that's how I ran with that. So I don't know if I ever run again, it will probably be, um, for, um, at large. Okay. Yeah. But I don't know because I mean we'll see how effective, you know, what we can get done with this with this work that we're getting ready to do the beginning of next year. What we can get done yeah. with that, I may just stick with that because, you know, I've I've built some connections and uh, hopefully good. I have some people that will that will help you know really open the doors that need to be open to make make this successful. What we plan on doing in the community next year. Yes, and you know, success comes with pain. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Mm-hmm. It comes with pain, you you know, and people don't understand. You deal with blood, sweat, and tears mm-hmm. along the way, yeah. and it it always happens to people with passion. Yeah, and I really love what they do and everything. Mm-hmm. I don't understand it. I never could understand it. Like, why do we go through so much? Right, trying to help the next person. Yeah, out. trying to literally help the next. Yes, person out. it's like when you do good, it's like, dang. So if you, so if I do evil, evilness, it's like it seems like people with evilness get blessed so much. Don't it? And I just don't oh. like how that happened. They oh. just did that, and they doing this right. and doing that, right. and it's like they just be so blessed, mm-hmm. and they live longer. It seems like it too. It seems like it. You know, you're looking at them like, dang, why is your life so good and you're a piece of crap? Mm-hmm. Not that my life's bad, but it's still it could Yeah, be better. right, you know right, like, right. <laughs> so it's like you just got to pray to God every day right. and just keep your head just level. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
<laughs> so what else are you doing today besides working? <coughs> Honestly, um, you know, I, I was, I'm, I'm a hustler, so I'll work three, four, five jobs at a time if I need to. I'll find little, you know, at one point, like last year, I wanted to buy my daughter a car, so I was working a catering job. I was taking catering deliveries through the week. I was working my job. Like, mm-hmm. I was cleaning offices at night. All of my jobs were flexible, so I'm just out here just getting it. Getting it. Um, but right now, I'm working one job, mm-hmm. and I'm just trying to rebuild my credit, rebuild my life, um, find mm-hmm. me who I am, be comfortable with me instead of who everybody else thinks I should be, Mm -hmm. Um, have less ego. I think you should put your testimony out there more. I think you should do that because a lot of people, you will be surprised of the, the people that you will have supporting you. Everybody loves to hear an inspiring story because you're still a working in progress. But it's good things that's coming to you. But I feel like if you put your story out there, do a book, like you say, you're working on a book and things. If you brand yourself of who you are, I feel like you will get a lot further that you want. Because there's a lot of women that would love to hear what you have to say. Mm -hmm. You're very inspiring. Oh, thank you. You Like, seriously, you are. You could go into women's shelters, do a lot of things just for women overall due to who you are today and the things that you've been through. And not knowing while you're helping all these women, it can help you too Mm -hmm. along the way as a therapy process. That's what I did with my girls group. Every time I helped my girls, it's like I was helping myself too. Mm -hmm. And I seen little bits and pieces of me in each and every one of them. Yeah. And I feel like that's where that's what you should do also. Just put put yourself out there more and don't feel ashamed. Like just I mean, it's better for you to put yourself out there more than somebody else telling your story when they don't even know what the hell they're talking about. Mm-hmm. So for you to put it out there more and it's like it's me. This is my story. This is who I am. This is what I've been through. You deal with it or not, you know. Even though it's certain people that that may get in trouble off things that you say, you could change names. You could do, you know, what I'm saying do things as far as changing stuff. But I feel like if you put it out there more instead of hiding, it'll help you a lot more than what you really expect. Cause you, I, I love you. <laughs> it's for real. It's cause you just, you're such a sweet person, and it's just the fact of this, the stuff that you've been through, and see how you look today. You are gorgeous, oh. and a lot of people just need to hear you. Like you even should do like YouTube videos or something. Just start branding you, okay. and that will makes it about you, and it, and you will start to see doors just open. For you. you, I've heard that before. Yes, you're, you're like the second or third time I've heard that in the last few years. Seriously, mm-hmm. you need to. You don't, uh, girl, listen. I'll help you <laughs> 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 because, like, I just love that. You know what I'm saying? Just see women that just get to that point. Like, look, this is what I'm about to do. Either you like it or not. You know, and then your kids can even help you with your testimony. Mm-hmm. You know, that you guys have a good relationship now. They could, That's even better, you know? And, uh, and a lot of people don't have that. Yeah. So, I mean, you you can help so many people in so many ways. You don't even know it. I think it's just because I just specifically focus on the addiction part of it. I don't really, you know, I, t- I talk about it. You know, every so often people will catch a post, you know, and mm-hmm. I'll, something will click. And I'll be like, I feel like I'm led to share that right now. But it doesn't happen like, you know, maybe two, three times a year, I'll do it. And I'll just be like, oh, you know, I remember this situation. And people are like, is that really for real? I'm like, you can't make it up. Like, mm-hmm. I didn't make this stuff up. You know, this is mm-hmm. what really happened. I just have never, I don't want to do it from a place of, of ego. Like, no, you know, you, I definitely don't want to do you that. You can't even think like that. Cause it's not that you're doing a place of ego. You're doing it at a place for you to heal. You know, because you have a lot of things that you want to say, even though you share bits and pieces. That's what brought me even more to notice you also. I already knew that you were running for council and everything like that. I thought that was just so dope because, you know, we need more women in those seats. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> we really, really do. But I had saw your story about the truck. That's um, of the situation that you went through with that. So it's like it's it's there. You you just gotta do it. Even if you're just recording yourself every day or something, just doing short videos or something, it's a way that you can do it. Okay. But when you're ready, you can come to me. I'll help you. Okay. For sure. <laughs> I promise you that okay. because it's, it's a lot of work. I just be wanting women to just get out there more. I, I mean, other women doing it. You got women every day. Some of them feel like showing they, they butt. And showing their breasts and stuff, you know, it's it's avoiding them for doing that. They're doing that for a reason, you know. So it's just we need to put more awareness out there on why we do what we do as yeah. a woman. Because I just feel like a lot of actions of women is deeper than what they're doing mm-hmm. right there. Mm-hmm. And people just don't get it. They just automatically want to put them down. Yeah. Put that label on them. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's it. Yeah. Not looking at the trauma that's behind it. Yes. It it, it has to be trauma behind mm-hmm. it. A lot of women aren't comfortable how they look, how their body is. Mm-hmm. They want to get surgery and mm-hmm. then the surgery don't go right. It's just, it's a lot it of things that women as a whole go through. And the way you feel about men, a lot of men makes us feel that way also. They play a huge part of it. Mm-hmm. I even did research on seeing that, like, majority of women, most women in prison is because of a man. Mm -hmm. Either killing them, selling drugs, just anything. It has to do with a man. So, it just, we just really have to bring more awareness, and I feel like you'll be a good advocate for it. All right. Let's do it. Okay, cool. So, um... I would like to thank everyone for tuning in to Life Her Podcast, where we help women heal all over the world. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram, Life Her Podcast, and also Facebook. And you can also check us out on our website, lifeherpodcast.com, to listen to other podcast episodes. And you can purchase Life Her merchandise. I am Yvette Lloyd, and I am her, and I am Life Her. Love yourself, ladies. Thank you for tuning in with Samara Cummins. Thanks. Bye. Bye.